So hello everybody, my name's Lisa, I'm the director at the Harley Gallery and this is our seventh online talk. Uh, the gallery is back open uh, to visitors and but we are going to continue this programme of talks um, which focus on displays either in the Harley Gallery or in the Portland Collection next door. So in a minute I'm going to pass you over to Louise and Liska to talk about the project Same Sea Different Boat which we've currently got on display here at the gallery. If you've got any questions, um, either specifically for Louise or for Liska, uh, do just use the chat box, which you can access at the bottom of your screen, and we will get onto those questions at the end of the talk. Uh, the talk will run for about 20 minutes, and then we'll have questions for 10 to 15 minutes. So I'm now uh, just going to introduce you to Louise and Liska, who I think you've got at the tops of your screen. Liska is a textile artist uh, in the West Midlands, and Louise works here in the Harley Foundation studios. Um, like I say, same sea, different boat. The project, the quilts, are on display here at the gallery, and you can see them until the 8th of August. The force behind the project, so I'm just letting some more people in, um, are, uh, is Sue Brown, and Sue can't be here today, but she's on screen at the Harley Gallery um, as part of the exhibition. So without further ado, I'm going to pass you on to Louise Asher and to Liska. Uh, Louise, over to you. Thank you, Lisa. Um... Thank you for all being here today. Um, it's a total pleasure to be talking to you about this wonderful project, Same Sea, Different Boat. Uh, as Lisa's already introduced me, I'm Louise Asher. Uh, I'm an artist here on the uh, Welbeck Estate, which is part of the Harley Foundation Studios. Uh, as well as my own practice from my studio here, I also uh, am the owner and run Hope and Elvis, which hosts um, various artists and makers from all over the country who teach workshops in various different media. Uh, again, as Sue said, uh, unfortunately, Sue can't be here today. Um, she is teaching today, uh, but Sue is a printmaker uh, and exhibits all over the country. She also teaches mixed media and um, printmaking workshops from her studio, the uh, in Cheltenham, which is the Yard Art Space. Uh, joining me today uh, is Liska Johnson, uh, who I'll pass over to you now so she can just tell you a little bit more about her before we then go on to um, talk about the quilt. Let's go. Hello, hi, thank you all for tuning in. I'm Liska Johnson. I run Little Peace Barn Studio, which is in Worcestershire near Bromsgrove. So it's my working studio, but like Louise, I, um, we, we run some of our own workshops, some in-house workshops, but we also host lots of guest tutors um, from around the country. And that's how I came to know Sue Brown. So Sue, she's run workshops for both of us. She's run some of her signature printmaking workshops at Little Heath Barn and at Hope and Elvis. Um, so as Lisa said, Sue's the driving force behind the project. So how it began, um, Same Sea, Different Boat was born around this time last year. So we all run similar businesses and therefore we were all kind of found ourselves in similar positions, um, not really knowing what, what was ahead of us over the next few months. All trying to keep our communities motivated with creative prompts, chats and Zooms but we could feel that their motivation was um, starting to, well, they were starting to lose their motivation. So Sue contacted Louise and I individually with the idea of what we thought would be a small um, community quilt project. Um, and it would be a nice way to engage our communities and bring everyone together. She was keen to get us on board because our, our, our studios are predominantly textiles. So it made sense to, to get, to pull the communities together. We all had some reservations about whether printers would want to stitch, whether the stitchers would want to print, but we kind of ploughed on anyway, and we're so glad that we did. Um, so this slide, the Collagraph slide, shows Sue in action making a Collagraph. So the idea behind the project was that we would invite people to make a Collagraph plate, which would then be stitched in, which would then be sent to Sue. Sue would print them, send them back to you, and then you'd stitch into them. 
Um, also giving people the option of just doing a stitch square, so no color graph printing. So there was a bit of variety. So Louise and I were both completely new to color graph printing. We'd never done it before. So we were the guinea pigs. Sue put together some very clear step-by-step -step instructions. She sent those to Lou and I, we gave it a go. The results worked and we kind of, so we went for it. So we first of all invited our newsletter subscribers and then we added it onto social media. Sue's instructions were on her blog um, and it was, you know, with various ways of making a collar graph and the simplest of which just use a cereal box or a cardboard box. So no one had to go out and get any specialist materials. We could just do it with what we had around the house. Um, the makers and artists sent their squares back to Sue and the three of us have just been blown away. We thought we would maybe get 100 squares, which would make a nice panel, one nice quilt. And I think so far, Sue has printed around 500 and they are still arriving. I think the next slide shows the quilt coming together and I'll pass you back to Louise. <laughs> yeah, apologies for my forward and back motion with the, <laughs> it was practiced, but uh, all the best things obviously go a little bit wayward on the day. Uh, so as you can see from um, the image that you can now see on your screen, the, the images are all of the same size. That was something that we did specify when we put out the instructions. The reason for this is so, well, for one thing, it made it a lot easier to construct the final piece, but also the size, we did talk about the size quite a lot because we wanted it to be not too overwhelming for people to have at the side of them or in their bag or even out on a walk that they could just take it out and stitch a little bit into it. Um, they weren't too overwhelming. Uh, as Liska said, we had people that had never stitched before. Um, and so we didn't want to make it particularly overwhelming. What is amazing and what you can see actually from the slides in front of you, the amount of detail in such a small piece of work and, um, and, and, and just the story, that tiny square towels was phenomenal. And we were all really taken aback by the first squares that started to come back. So it soon became apparent that we were dealing with something really quite large. Um, and again, as Liska said, I think our expectations at the beginning was something that we could kind of keep contact with our um, communities with. Just something, you know, everybody was feeling a bit strange and it was initially just something to think, actually, let's reach out to the people that, you know, that we can and say, let's all do this together. We're all in this. And, it, and that's as small as it was going to be. It was just going to be something nice to pass between our three studios of something shared between our communities. The, they came, I mean, the postman must have wondered what on earth was happening at Sue's house because there was bag, bag loads of things arriving from all over the world as well. So, yeah, Sue always had a little inkling that this was going to be an incredibly large project. Um, I think she had a, a, a special sixth sense on that one. At this point, when things did start to arrive and, and how incredible it was all going to be, um, the three of us did panic a little bit because <laughs> we're not quilters um, and we'd called it a quilt already, which we did think was a little bit of a dangerous statement as we were aware that the quilters of the country may be thinking, ooh, are they going to get this right? So at this point, we um, actually a textiles artist called uh, Catherine Kingset, who is Sue's friend, had um, incredible knowledge, uh, well, an incredible more knowledge <laughs> than Liska, Sue and I. Um, so Catherine gave us her expertise and that has been invaluable in putting and the way that she's actually put this quilt together with Sue and we made up yeah. a sample um, lots of uh, lots of testing out to see which way was going to be the best way to construct the uh, the final piece. So as I said, Catherine is a, a textiles artist and also teaches. So uh, without her, we may have been in a bit of a pickle with the construction. Um, what Catherine has also done, and I will remember to move the slide along, because as well as the squares arriving daily, 
what we hadn't expected was the incredible amount of letters and cards um, and notes and little stitched tags that came with the squares. They were really moving. Um, the stories of hopelessness and worry, but also the stories of joy, of love, of hope and laughter, lots of laughter. So the letters we did, we felt that were of an equal importance. Um, and although many of them quite private and, you know, there is certain things that we, we wouldn't share, we thought it was really important that the, the letters stay with the quilt. So Catherine has made the most amazing bag. Uh, I think you'll be able to see that in the one side of your screen if you can't just see our faces down there. So the letters will travel with the quilt. So they stay together and they'll all stay together and it will be a really quite important um, document, uh, historical document in textiles. So wherever the quilt goes, the letters go. Um, and I lost hours and hours and hours, and I know everybody else did as well, reading through these letters and, and cried and laughed and, and a whole range of emotions by looking at the, the pieces and the letters that came together. So on to um, the next slide. <laughs> okay, so we just picked out, if you've already been to see um, the quilt at the Harley, then you will, you know, it, it's, it's quite overwhelming when you see it all together. Each individual square tells a story, but the stories together make something absolutely incredible. And it has a real aura and feeling about it that you can't actually explain until you've seen it. And you can look at it a thousand times. Mm -hmm. And each time you look at it, you'll get something else from it. Um, it has been a total pleasure to be involved in the project. Uh, nobody could ever have imagined the, the events that would take place over this last 18 months. Um, something on such a massive scale that it would affect every person from every walk of life uh, and on such a huge scale and all at the same time. So the fact that we have this, this documentation, this textiles piece of work um, that actually shows everything that's happening to people as we speak and is happening still every day. Also, what was really interesting to see is although the quilt was born out of the COVID pandemic, the world didn't stop either. So even on the small squares, uh, the example that you can see on your screen at the minute, we have, um, we have things like the appreciation of the NHS, which is not new, you know, but it brings, it brought things to the forefront of people's minds. The amazing emergency services and all the key workers that helped keep everything going while the world was in such turmoil. Um, the Black Lives Matter movement, uh, child poverty, food poverty, uh, and also Brexit, to name but a few, all had, a, of, all appeared on the quilt. So not only is, is it a document of the COVID, it's also the 18 months of the world at the same time, uh, because other things didn't stop. You know, the world carried on, although we were, we were all in a really weird place. So to have individual ideas and thoughts and feelings in these incredible squares just is just a, a huge overview um, of, of 18 months of, of every single person's life. Also, what was really nice is the things that I kind of think we all took a step back, things that were on our doorsteps, um, our gardens, you know, our surrounding areas. We found, I know that even just on my street, you know, we saw people that we'd never spoken to before. Um, and I got, I, I got the next door neighbour to send a square in as well, but I didn't know she could stitch and she could. Mm -hmm. So, you know, so that's something now I know I've got in common with my next door neighbour and that wouldn't have happened without this. Um, you know, walks that are on your doorstep that you perhaps would never, you'd have gone further afield to go for a walk. So all these little squares depict people's cycling routes that changed, people's gardens and things, you know, they, 
they made preserves, they baked bread, and all this is shown in this in this beautiful, beautiful quilt. Um, I think I've rabbled on a lot about the quilt from my point of view now, so I'm going to pass, because I, I could keep going. Um, I will pass back over to, to Liska about her feelings of the, of the quilt. Thank you. So yeah, as Louise said, we've had squares from, I mean, obviously the majority are from every corner of the UK, but we've had squares from further afield as well. We've had squares from contributions from India, Australia, Canada, the United States, France, Germany, Netherlands, Republic of Ireland, Switzerland, Norway and South Africa. I think that's everywhere. There might be more and there's still coming in. So it's amazing. And um, when the, the quilt, so bef when we had the little gap between lockdowns, it went on display at the museum in the park in Stroud. And when Sue was there, she met a group of school children who were visiting the museum in the park and spoke to them and their teacher. And actually there's on the well, I think it's on the fifth panel, there's a set of squares which have been produced by, um, by a class at Randwick Junior School in Stroud. So it's really lovely that you've got children getting involved, you've got families getting involved. We've also had squares contributions from some textile artists that you might know. So there's a square from Kaz Holmes on one of the panels and the quilt's actually being featured in her next book, which is called Embroidering the Everyday, which um, I think you can pre-order at the moment. The square Amanda Hislop's contributed and Kelly, Mrs. Bertimus, to name a few. So it's lovely. It's not selective. Every single square that was sent to Sue is on the quilt. Nothing has been eliminated. You know, there's, there's no reason to. And they're all just beautiful stories every quilt is like a gallery of its own so we kind of when we curated the quilt we wanted to keep it quite simple we had discussions about what the best way to do it was you know what color the background should be etc and we just all agreed that we wanted to keep it as simple as possible and hopefully do it to the best of our abilities as Louise said we're not quilters so we had a lot of instructions along the way but I think um, I think that the, the way the quilt's been constructed it allows the squares to speak for themselves um, and we've all contributed. On this screen here, you can spot a few Corvids. So that is Sue's contribution. Obviously, as a printmaker, Sue wanted to do a series. So there are 19 COVID Corvids um, amongst the panels of the quilt, which is fab. Um, I did a couple of squares. So actually, you can on this screen, you can just about see um, my square. So it's on the left-hand side, the very left-hand side. It's the third one down. It's slightly chopped off. But... Um, it's based, I'd never done a collar graph, so I was just using wallpaper and a cardboard box that I had around the house. But it's a very kind of abstract view of a walk I went on with my children. So like Louise said, we're all walking much more than usual and going to different places. And we'd all been clapping for the NHS and we'd all been painting rainbows and putting them in our windows, which was lovely. My children are five and eight. So we were on the top of the beacon in the Lickies and Lucas, who's five, said, Mummy, look, there's a rainbow. Do you think God did it to say thank you to the nurses? And it was just a really lovely moment that kind of stuck with me. And actually, it's nice that it's on the quilt because it reminds me of that moment. And it was just, a, you know, through the eyes of the five-year-old, the rainbow was there to say thank you to the nurses. And that was just really quite special. So I know that how personal those squares are to me. And knowing that every single square, you know, five, I don't know what the... The, the number we're at at the moment that the 500 that we've got are all that personal to the person to whoever's made them it's just you know it's fabulous it's a wonderful project to be part of so um panel six yes um actually for more images because we it, it was impossible to to kind of show you every single square today um, but over last week, there's a lot of images on the Harley Gallery Instagram page that show um, uh, individual panels. We tried to get every single piece on there. So if you aren't able to, um, to go along to the exhibition, um, then on um, all, the, all the squares can be seen on either the Harley Gallery uh, Instagram or my Instagram at Hope and Elvis, um, Liska's Instagram at Little Heath Barn studios and also on Sue Brown's and I'm talking about Sue Brown's blog and Instagram as the, we're still in the pandemic um, mm -hmm. and they are still coming in thick and fast and every single day Sue receives another collagraph to print out and send back to be stitched in of an individual story 
So panel six, the image you can see now is uh, how full panel six is. Panel six isn't finished, but is in construction. So there is still time. And also what we found is we've had some people uh, message to say, can we send another one in? Because since I sent my last square in, this has happened and I feel like I need to get it on the quilt. So you are still able to contribute to this quilt and it will be contributed to as it travels around the country in various places. So to tell your pandemic story, uh, your lockdown story, um, if you head over to Sue Brown's, um, there is a link from her Instagram, or if you uh, pop in the, it's on the screen now, her blogspot.com address, and it gives you from literally one to how many, the steps of how to do the collagraph, if you don't want to do a collagraph, if you just want to do a stitch, exactly how you can be involved. Um, it's open to anybody. You don't have to be a printer. You don't have to be a stitcher. You don't have to have any of those skills whatsoever. It is just your thoughts and feelings on a square. However you choose to do that is entirely up to you. So as you can see from on the screen at the moment, it gives you information about all our Instagrams. And also if you do use social media, the hashtag same sea different boat has in excess of 600 posts of people's um, own photographs and uh, lots of different information about, about the project. If you, uh, and then I think, I think, let me, <laughs> yes. That's it. Back to you, Lisa. I think I've exhausted my list of things I needed to tell you. <laughs> Thanks very much, Louise. Thanks, Liska. Thanks, everybody, for listening. So that was great to hear a bit about it. I mean, I've got a number of questions, but two that have come in. Um, I think uh, somebody uh, uh, asked, um, exactly, can you explain a bit more of what a collagraph is? And my sort of question is, why did Sue pick collagraphing? So, I mean, collagraph is one of Sue's kind of signature printmaking styles that she works with. And I think she picked it because you could do it with things that you had around the house. You didn't need, other than the printing press, which Sue had, hence why everyone was invited to send them back to her and then she'd return the fabric. You didn't need anything specialist to do it and you can put your own sort of personality on it. So a collagraph is, I did actually um, message Sue to find out what, what a collagraph was because we had never done one. It's a print plate using textures to create tones and marks on a base. Ink is pushed into the marks and polished off the top surface. It is then passed through a press with the fabric. So hopefully that makes sense. So where the texture is on the printing plate, it will pick up the ink differently. And therefore, when it goes through the press with a fabric, it makes, you know, it makes marks. And you can, you know, in the instructions, it tells you about using PVA glue to, to keep some white areas and things like that. But it's all on Sue's blog spot. And so uh, for, for me, I'm just going to go on I, either of you that my question was, it was sort of what's really interesting for me. I don't know for those of you who haven't seen the quilt, uh, Liska and Louise are talking about a quilt. But in fact, it's six artworks made up of individual artworks. And I think quilt's a really interesting word in this context, because, of course, quilts are also known as comforters. They keep you warm, they keep you safe. And um, I think that's an added dimension. And somebody has asked how you made the quilt or what you call the quilts. So could you explain, perhaps, Louise, uh, exactly what it is? Yes. Both of you have created and how you went about yeah. it. I mean, we call it a quilt because I think originally it was going to be one fabric um, panel um, that between the three of us, we would cobble together as a quilt to show in our individual studios. And like I said, we did have a panicked time when we thought, actually, this is going to be so much more. Uh, and like Lisa said, it is, they are individual pieces of, of, of art, you know, the, and so it came much more, I mean, we still call it a quilt all the time because that's kind of where its starting point was. Um, but yeah, it's really interesting you say about the, the fact that it's, it's kind of a protection. 
uh, and it does actually make you feel like that when you see it. Um, we were told in much detail by the lovely Catherine um, of the techniques and we all had a hand in putting this together and I think that was quite important that we all did that. Um, although I think my uh, skills were flicked off slightly after I did one panel, which is absolutely fine. But I think, um, yeah, the others seem to be a little bit more <laughs> skilled than me. Um, so yeah, so we uh, everything was done in the traditional way, although we did machine um, quilt it, if you like, uh, but we, everything was kind of placed and hand-stitched to start with. We uh, hemmed every, every square before it was applied to the quilt. Um, and because of the, the size that we specified, uh, it worked incredibly well. Um, so, and then it was machine quilted by, uh, predominantly by Sue and, Sue and Catherine. Thank you. Can I just ask Louise Lisker, you know, three of you in different studios uh, in different parts of the UK uh, have pulled off this quite incredible um, communal project. And I, what I wanted to know is how did you manage to even come together as a group of three when you weren't allowed to travel and then develop a dialogue and develop the idea for this project? It was very much down to Sue, wasn't it, Louise, who was kind of the, the middle person and not, not the go-between is the wrong kind of word, but she was communicating with both of us. Obviously, we set up a little WhatsApp group for the three of us. And when we did the first, when we first launched it, if you like, and invited people to take part, we put a deadline on it. I think it was around, was it about a month, Louise? Yeah, I think it was kind of uh, the end of June. I yeah, something, so yeah, so... Deadline. So then once we'd had the initial kind of batch of squares and contributions, which was a lot already, it was over 300 by the, far, you know, even after that first month, and then it's kind of trickled in since then. So we set a date, it, when, the, when the restrictions eased a little bit over the summer, we all got together at my studio in Worcestershire, because it's, not, it's not quite halfway, but it's the middle one of the three. So Louise and Sue both came to Little Heath Barn. Sorry, you can hear my dog tapping around. Um, Louise and Sue both came to Little Heath Barn Studio. We had a um, socially distanced catch up. We went through the squares that we had so far and divided them between the three of us um, and kind of came up with a, a plan of what we were going to do. So we had our backing fabrics. We had we knew we were going to grid them up. And then so after that, we all we went off, we stitched them on, and then we both then saw Sue individually, didn't we, to go through the actual construction of the quilt, so putting the wadding and the backing on. Yeah, we, it was a lot of Zoom calls, mm -hmm. um, a lot of WhatsApp group calls, uh, a lot of close-ups, a lot of really shaky close-ups where we're trying to explain something, you've got your phone, you're trying to like look at the quilt, saying, what about this bit? What about this bit? What have I done with this bit? Quite a few tears. <laughs> you know, so there was a, as well as the emotion that was leaping off off the the pieces of work. There was a lot of emotion went into the pieces of work because we were we were all so aware that we were dealing with people's such precious thoughts and feelings that it it almost became um, it. Well, it was so important that the three of us communicated so incredibly well to be able to make to to really do this project justice. Yeah. And I think it was lovely to get together to meet at the Harley and put it up together for its first kind of proper ex exhibition. That was really lovely to do as well. Well, I think you've done a brilliant job because as I sit here listening and I can see um, some of the people who joined us today and you have managed it in your project to bring together 500 or so very different voices. And at the same time, you have created a very um, particular single piece of art. And that's just, um, well, it's a huge success. And we're delighted to have it at the Harley. And I really hope that some of the participants here today are gonna to be able to come and see it themselves. Yeah, before we go, can I just say, um, Lisa, that it's, it's we, from all of us, it's, um, we can't thank you enough. And for everybody that, mm -hmm. uh, join today and for everybody that's contributed to this because without you it wouldn't be a thing um so that's really important it's not our project it's all of our projects and and i know that the the comments that we've been seeing on social media 
uh, when people have seen it or they've commented when it's popped up on on an Instagram saying that's my square. You know, it does feel like the te- the what am I trying to say? The community spirit, I think, has has been pushed so much into the forefront over this and and the creative community especially has just been absolutely incredible um so as much as you know i think it's helped lots of people in lots of different ways so to be able to have it in a gallery like the harley is totally overwhelming so the opportunity for us to be able to to share it with you in such a wonderful place is all down to down to Lisa and and all the staff at the Harley, which you can't thank you enough. So thank you. Yeah, thank no you very problem. much. I've, I've just had a question, Louise and Niska, asking if the quilt will uh, tour on to anywhere else. And Gillian is asking how long it will be on display for here, and it is going to be up until Sunday, the eighth of August. But is it going anywhere else, Louise or Niska? It is just when it leaves the Harley, um, it does have a little bit of a break um, because we what we're dealing with is lots of galleries would like it. But because of the backlog of their programs and uh, everything they have to fit in, we kind of have to wait our turn. Uh, So we've had lots and lots of interest for some very exciting places. Uh, But confirmed at the moment is the Salisbury Art Centre, which is January 22 and Cheltenham Museum, which I believe is November, but again, that may that may change slightly. Um, but we have at least another six potential venues um, that we're, we're in talks with at the moment, and, as, and everybody's eager to get it in as soon as possible while it's so relevant. Mm-hmm. Um, and as far as where we'd like it to end up, of course we'd like for it to end up in the V&A. <laughs> um, and I'm sure they'll be getting might even do a petition let's get this quilt in the vna <laughs> so we will try our best to it, it, it's such an i feel now it's such an important piece of textiles um that it needs to be it needs to go somewhere very special Definitely. okay well thank you very much everybody there's um a question from um i think mandy saying Please, can it come to Plymouth? So can you add that to your list, Louise and Liska? On, don't worry. Don't worry, Mandy. I've made a note. Plymouth. <laughs> and if you know anywhere in Plymouth that would be a good venue, let us know. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Okay. So, everybody, I hope you'll join us um, next month where we've got author Joe Willett, who's going to be talking about a pretty amazing 18th century woman called Lady Mary Wortley, who was absolutely at the forefront in the 1700s in inoculations against disease. So she was very friendly with one of the owners of Welbeck, Lady Henrietta. And I hope that will be a really interesting talk and that we see some of you there next month. Thank you very much, Louise, Niska, and all of you for taking part and attending today. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye.